How many of you are thankful? Got thankful people? Hey, they clappers over here. Y'all are the silent ones over here. You just wave. How many thankful that you missed an hour of sleep last night? Bible says to be thankful in all things, all circumstances. Our uh, friends that are in Israel, for those that don't know, Pastor Weaver's in Israel, and uh, Pastor Brett, Pastor Gary, and 24 of them total are in Israel, and uh, they, I believe, are now, instead of eight hours ahead of us, seven hours ahead, because we, we moved ahead an hour, and I don't know it, that Israel changed time or not, but I'm certain that they didn't, because they're a lot smarter than we are, so... And if they didn't change time, it proves that they are smarter than we are. I don't know why we change time. It's just a, a nuisance. How many agree with that? Yeah. If you, yes. I don't know why we do it, but we, we just fall in line and move our clocks. They tell us to move our clocks and move our clocks. I remember when our kids were small, Jeannie used to change our clocks like at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday. <laughs> and that way we lost an hour in our day. We didn't lose an hour of sleep. Uh, now everything changes automatically. And uh, that just has me all goofed up. But uh, our, uh, our friends in Israel, they could be watching us right now. If it's 11 o'clock here, that makes it 6 o'clock in the evening Israel time. And uh, I heard before the early service, uh, Julie said that Pastor Brett had contacted her and said they were in Jerusalem. So uh, they will be in Jerusalem for the next week until they come home. And uh, they'll be seeing some amazing things, kind of the New Testament portion of their, of their trip. They have seen uh, some amazing things just today in their day. Now it's dinner time there, but today they saw, um, they saw uh, Beit Shan, and, um, which is a, a, a Roman city. Just some amazing things there uh, that was built in Israel. And um, Shiloh, which was a, a real highlight for me a couple years when we went there, where the tabernacle actually was for like 350 years. Uh, a very, very cool experience to be there. And uh, so they're going to be seeing some amazing things tomorrow there at the, uh, the um, museum, the Israel Museum, spending the day there. So keep them in your prayers. They will be coming home on Saturday. I was going to say a bunch of things about Pastor Weaver, but then I thought he might be watching online. So hi, Pastor. How many of you appreciate the live stream? I know there's been a lot of sickness since I've heard from several people that that's kind of been their lifeline through uh, the winter months and a lot of sickness that people have had. Keep, keep one another in your prayers. I think we're, we're seeing the end of this, hopefully, uh, getting into some better weather and uh, much more health. Uh, um, so keep, keep one another in prayer. We're in a series, started last week, uh, God of My Days, and uh, we'll continue through next week just pulling out some, some truths and promises from God's Word. Last week, we looked at the fact that God is for us. And scripture says, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? And uh, we know that God is for us. He's shown us that in so many ways and proven it over and over. And we know that God cares for us. He loves us. And, uh, and he is for us in every way. And not just for us. He's for everyone. And uh, we're thankful for that. Today we're looking at the, the promise that God is with me. God is with me. A couple of uh, big theological words that maybe you've heard uh, over time, maybe you haven't, and it doesn't really matter if you have or haven't, but three words, Om, omnipotent, which talks about God's, uh, God is, has all power, uh, om, om, omniscience, he is omniscient, means he knows everything. You realize that nothing has ever occurred to God, because he already knows it all. And I'm thankful that he knows things that I don't know. He knows everything. And today we're talking about the fact that God is with me. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. What that means is that God is with us right here today, right now in this place. And you say, of course he is. It's church. It's God's house. He lives here. Right? Paul said, uh, to, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, don't you realize that your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? The reality is, is that you are the house for the Holy Spirit. 
He's chosen to take up residence in you. And so you don't come here and meet with God, although we meet here with God. God goes with you when you leave today. He is with you because as a believer in Christ who has given their life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit now resides in you. You are his home. I pray that my life is a, is a place where he can take up residence and feel at home in me. That should, be, that should be the focus and desire of all of our hearts. It's good to have Tina and Jeremy here. Tina and Jeremy Skinner are uh, newly appointed missionaries to Indonesia. We're excited for you guys. I went on Tina's first missions trip. She went with me to uh, Montana. And now you're all the way on the other side of the world. It's good to have you guys here. All right, I'm easily distracted. But I meant to say something and I forgot until I saw you guys. So um, I've got a lot of scripture like I did last week. And so it, it, it's not all going to be on the screen. If you've got a pen, paper, you might want to take some notes, go back and look at some of this uh, after the fact. But today we're looking at this truth and this promise that God is with us. Psalm 139 verse 7 asks two questions. These two questions which are rhetorical questions. Where can I go from your spirit where can I flee from your presence? I say rhetorical because we know the answer. Where can we go where God is not? God is everywhere at the same time. The New Living Translation doesn't have it in the form of a question, but two exclamations. Verse 7 of the New Living Translation, and we're going to read on, says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even darkness I cannot hide from you. To you, night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. And this just tells us again that there is absolutely nowhere in creation where we can go to ever get away from the presence of God. So we can try to run away from God, but we cannot run away. We cannot get anywhere where he's not. There may be people sitting in the room today. You're here in church, but maybe in your heart and in your spirit, you're trying to get away from God. There is nowhere you can go. And the reality is he's everywhere because he cares for you, because God is for you. God's not just everywhere and impersonal. He's with us, he loves us, and he's for us. And as we learned last week, he's for everyone, not just people who are here, not just people who call themselves Christians. He is for every, everyone, every part of creation. He is for us. Talk about, as we talk about God being with us, I, I want us to think about the power of presence. Especially to a child, the, the power of presence. Personal presence makes all the difference. So a parent in the room or in the house brings peace and safety. I don't know if you ever remember adults when you were a child or, or, or or our young people that are here, you ever remember being a kid and being in your house alone, home alone? And you remember the feeling that you had, you're the only one there and you're hearing every, every creak and every pop and, every, and you can just convince yourself that someone's downstairs or upstairs. There's someone else in the house besides you. How many of you know what that feels like, okay? Or I remember being convinced there's somebody underneath my bed. Be honest, how many of you ever remember like leaning over the edge of your bed and just in a moment pulling up the covers and looking? Anybody else or is that just me? Or you make the, you, you, you're in your bed and you get on the, on the bed and you're just ready to leap for the light switch and turn the light switch on and go, ha! Because you're just sure that somebody's in there with you. Being alone is, is, is tough. And, uh, but how many of you know just somebody else being there makes it so much better. You could be an adult, and um, just having a child there just brings confidence 
and uh, you, you're not afraid. You might get afraid. You might have anxiety and worry all alone, but it doesn't matter how old you are. Someone there, the presence of another person, there's power in that. Just a warm body, it doesn't matter. The presence of someone else brings confidence and clarity and security and thinking to, uh, to, your, to your situations and to your thinking. It's the power of presence. Um, today we're talking about the powerful presence of God in our lives. There's a song that... Uh, I learned uh, probably in my high school years, and this is going to date me a little bit, and some of you may have heard this song, and some of you might say, well, you're just a pup if you learned that when you were in high school. And I realize that I am just a kid, and I'm not that old, but I did turn 50, like last month. So, so whistles and some oohs and ahs and... Uh, but this song that I remember learning when I was in high school at camp, and it's a song that uh, really, um, even when I, when I hear it now, just kind of moves me emotionally, and the song is Surely the Presence of the Lord. How many of you know that song? Why don't you join me as we sing that song? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And so we sing that song, and that song brings a lot of emotion to me because I remember times singing that song and just being overcome with the reality of the fact of the presence of Almighty God. And it's not a song that brings that, but when we make a statement like that and realize that surely God's presence is here, whether we stop to think about it or not, his presence is here because his presence is here. And when we all come together, there is a collectiveness of, of God's spirit when we all get together. And just like the disciples in the upper room, they were in, in one accord, they were of one mind, and the spirit of God came and moved there in a mighty way. And the possibility and the potential of what can happen in the presence of God it's amazing, absolutely amazing. God promises us over and over through Scripture that he's with us. And I want to go back through a few, uh, a few events from the Bible and different people uh, where God promised, and we go back to the book of Exodus with Moses. And God called Moses to rise up and to go and deliver the people from the Egyptians, deliver the Israelites. Chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 9, look, God says, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God. Who am I that I should appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, saying, I will be with you. Moses had no credentials. He's saying, look, I, I'm not up to it. I'm not confident enough. I'm nobody. Who am I? And God simply answers, I'm with you. And that was enough. The book of Joshua chapter 1 Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will ever be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you. 
as I was with, with, as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. God's promises he would be with them. In the book of Judges, chapter 6, we see a man named Gideon. Gideon was visited by an angel, by uh, a messenger from God, and verse 11, it says, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. They were being oppressed by the Midianites. The Midianites had taken everything that they had. They basically stripped them bare. And so here is Gideon, and he's threshing wheat in a wine press, not not a place where you thresh wheat, not, a, not, not logical at all, but hiding out because he was scared, trying to save a little bit of food for him and his family. Verse 12 says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? I wonder how many of you have thought that or said that yourself. God, if you truly are with us, why did you let this happen? How many of you have ever thought that before? Or you look at the world around you and say, God, if you're with us, why is all the, all the trouble going on in the world? And Gideon was in that place. He's saying, look, you promised to be with us. You say you're with us, but look at what's going on around us. And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have. And rescue Israel from the Midianites, I am sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest of the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least of my entire family. And the Lord said to him, what did he say? I will be with you. I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. The book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. See King Jehoshaphat and the armies of the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Munites had declared war on King Jehoshaphat. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men that were in their group there. And it says in 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 15, he said, this is what he said, speaking a word from the Lord. Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the, valley, at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still, and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. And if the Lord is with you, who could ever be against you? If God is for you and God is with you, he, that's all we need to know. The book of, jo uh, the book of Genesis has a, a story of Joseph, and Joseph could have been the example for us last week as we talked about the fact that God is for us. Joseph was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, and we pick up this story in Genesis 39, if you've got time to go back and look at this later. Genesis 39, verse 1 to 4, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So his brothers, who had plotted to kill him, decided, no, we'll just sell him as a slave and act as if he's dead. And so he was sold into slavery, and this man Potiphar purchases him. And verse 2 says, the Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so soon he made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. Everything was going great for Joseph. They recognized that the Lord was with Joseph. But you know the story, he was falsely accused by his master's wife who tried to seduce him. In verse 20 it says uh, that Potiphar took Joseph and he threw him into prison upon the accusation of his wife where the king's prisoners were held and, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. 
Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. So Joseph, a prisoner, was now elevated to being over the prison. I wonder what that guard did. Sit back and watch TV all day, I'm sure. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. So four times in chapter 39 of Genesis, this phrase shows up that the Lord was with Joseph, twice as a slave, twice as a prisoner. Why does it show up so often in the story of Joseph? It's not for Joseph's benefit. He, he didn't read the story. He lived the life. God repeats that phrase for, for us so that we'll see that he was there with Joseph in the trials and tribulations. One thing is for certain is that trials and tribulations are going to come our way, but God's promise to us has been, is, and forever will be because God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, he doesn't change. And so the fact that he was with them then, he's with us now, and he'll forever be with us. And so through the trials and through the tribulations, God's promise is, I'm going to be with you. If, if he hadn't stated that in the story of Joseph, our human nature would have assumed that because, because of Joseph's circumstances, God had abandoned him. But over and over it tells us that God was with Joseph. And you can read at the end of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 20, where Joseph is conversing with his brothers. His brothers were afraid their dad had died, and now they were afraid that Joseph was going to kill them. And so in fear and trembling, they came and threw themselves at Joseph's feet. And, and he said this to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. See, God had his hand on Joseph, and God was with Joseph through it all. And he will be with you. Through all of your trials, through all of your tribulations, through all of your circumstances, through all your suffering, and through your sorrow, God will be with you. There's so many scriptures, I'm going to read a few here, and uh, then I'm going to make a couple of points and we'll be done. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Isaiah 41, 10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hebrews 13, 5 says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In the message version, it says, never, I will never let you down, I'll never walk away from you. Matthew 28, as Jesus is commissioning his disciples, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. 1 John 4, 15, all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. So this is the promise, that we have God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, who has taken up residence in those who are believers in Christ. And his promise is, I'm never going to leave you, never going to walk away, never going to turn my back on you, I'm never going to let you go. I am with you always, and I'm for you. God loves us, and he cares for us. God's immediate, tangible, authentic, genuine, real presence is always with those who declare Jesus as Lord. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Knowing the fact that he's always with us and that he will never leave us, what difference does that make in how we live our life? Does that make a difference? Does knowing the fact that God is with you change how you live? When you're a teenager, did you act differently with your parents in the room than you did when they were nowhere to be found? <laughs> There's things that we may do in the presence of friends that we would never do with our parents around. How many of you agree with that? You've lived that and you've proved that, okay? Why is that the case? Why aren't you gonna say the stupid things or do the stupid things when your mom and dad are in the room? Because their presence, right? 
It just changes things. You're not going to do that in front of your mom and dad. I don't know where I picked this up. I don't know if it was something that my parents taught me or I picked it up in church or something like that. But I, ha- I lived with this, this thought. I-, I-, I told you last week that I grew up in church. I grew up sleeping under the pews and picking gum off the bottom of the pews. I just remember, I just remember being in church. That's, that's all I know is growing up, going to church on Sunday and being part of a church body. Uh, being a Christian. Um, somewhere this thought crossed my mind, and I think it was taught to me, but I couldn't tell you if it was my parents or, or whatever, but this thought that God is always watching you. That changes what you do. Be sure God is, God's watching you. Okay, you think, okay, if mom and dad are watching me, I'm not going to do this or that, or if the teacher's in the room and the teacher's watching, you know, I'm not going to do this. But why, why, why do we not think about that with God? You know, we think of it like that, like God's watching, like he's just looking for us to mess up so he can whack us, you know, and knock us down. But that's not, that's not who God is. But the fact that he's always watching and he's always with us should change how we live. See, there's things that we do uh, when nobody else is around. And if we stopped and realized that God's presence is always with me, that God knows everything that I'm doing, he sees everything, In reality, it should change how we live. If we truly, truly believe that God's presence is with us, it would change how we live, both privately and publicly. The promise that we have from God over and over again is, I will be with you. But just because God is with you doesn't mean that you're with God. So this is a question that I want to ask this morning. Are you with God? We've established the fact, and I think we all understand, that God is with us wherever we go. He will be with us. He has been with us. He'll forever be with us. There's nowhere that we can go where he's not. God's presence is everywhere. Nowhere that we can go if we think we're trying to run away from God. We're just fooling ourselves. He's there. He cares about you. He loves you, and he's working things together for good in your life. But knowing the fact that he's with you says nothing about the fact that we're with him. And I think that's the real question today. Are we with him? How can I be with him? It's all, it's all the, the whole uh, thing of presence. How can we be with God? You see, my wife Jeannie and I, we could be in the same house. But we could be two, in two totally separate things, and it doesn't matter if we're in the same house or if I'm in Israel. We're, we're far apart doing two different things. It's just because we're in the same room or in the same house doesn't mean we're with each other. You hear what I'm saying? But if I'm in that house and I, and I go and I park myself across from her and I catch eye contact with her, am I with her? It's the beginning. And I look into her eyes and I begin to talk to her and talk with her and she talks to me. Guess what, all of a sudden, we've, we're, now we're in each other's presence. Just because we're there doesn't mean we are there, if that makes sense. Just because you're here. You see what I'm saying? Just because we're here doesn't mean we're with God. We're with other people. We're in the place where I believe God's presence is we sang the song and I believe it's true but are we with him how can we be with him I just got a four things real quick and then we'll, then we're finished how can I be with him the first thing is is talk to him talk to him so many so many people so many Christians are intimidated by prayer but here's the deal God simply wants a relationship He wants communication. He wants conversation. Prayer is not as difficult as we make it to be. I don't see anyone trembling with fear about sending a text message. Could it be that talking with God is as simple as typing out a simple text message? Click and send. What are we intimidated by? If we know that God loves us, he's for us, he's with us, why not just talk to him? The psalmist says, hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. And the promise that we looked at in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 last week says, don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. We've got a worry problem, we need to stop doing that, and how we do that is start praying about everything. Give it to God, take it to the Lord, and the promise is 
It says, tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. And then you will experience God's peace. Second thing we can do is not just talk with him, but listen. Listen to him. God speaks in a lot of different ways. God speaks through his word. And if we're not opening the word, then we're not able to listen to him speak to us that way. He has a lot to say to us through his word. Are you opening his word? If it's just a Sunday thing that you do, open it. Open it every day of the week. Look at, look at his word. What is he saying to you? God speaks through people. He can speak through our circumstances. He speaks by his spirit, that still, small voice. This morning I was coming to the church early. I lost my hour of sleep because I didn't go to bed early. Well, I kind of fell asleep in my recliner, so does that count? Um, but I got up early, so I was driving to church in the dark, and I had a few things that I needed to do. I was putting some stuff into the computer back there so you could have these graphics to look at. And that computer is possessed. If you want to pray for a computer, that <laughs> it, needs, it needs demons cast out of it. It's really bad. Um, I, I say that in all seriousness. It's bad. <laughs> Uh, but as I'm driving to, driving to church this morning, I'm thinking about the message and thinking what, what, needs, what I need to do. It's like I just, I just got this thought, and, and I knew it was from the Lord. And he said to me, when you, before, you, before you leave the, the church this morning to go over to your office, I want you to walk through the foyer and pray. And walk through the foyer, and, and, and what, I, what, I, what, I, what I just kind of sensed was, start back here in the foyer, that's what I did. I walked through the foyer, and then I walked down past the early childhood, and I walked back here, and I walked through the Yulestead Chapel, and I, and I came out this door right here, and I, I just, as I walked, I prayed. And I thought, oh, you know what, I'm just, I listened to God, and I just wanted to be obedient. And I'm thinking, I don't know what this is going to do, but if that's what God wants me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And so I walked, I walked through that, and I thought I just had this feeling that I needed to walk around the sanctuary a couple times. And on my way through here, I picked up one of these bottles of oil, and as I walked around, I just, I just took oil, and I, I anointed each one of those doorways. And then I walked down here, and I walked up and down every aisle, and I just prayed the whole time. Why would I do that? Just I mean, if you would have walked in this morning and you would have heard me just in here praying by myself, you, I don't know, you might have thought it's cool, you might have been freaked, I don't know. I'm just in the quietness of just me and, and a building. I wasn't scared, I was all alone. But I wasn't alone. And I was just listening to God and I'm thinking, I, Lord, it, it, what are you gonna do through this? I don't know. But I just wanted to be obedient. I didn't wanna miss something for you or me. So that's what I did. And I didn't plan on telling you guys this, but... You know what, I, I could have easily talked myself out of doing that thinking, yeah, I got too many things to do. But I realized I, I, don't, I don't have too many things to do if this is what God wants me to do and if it brings results this morning in some way, then that's what I'm gonna do. How often are we listening to what God's spirit would have us to do? Did I hear that wrong? Maybe, maybe it was just my own idea, but you know what, it, it, it didn't hurt anything. All it could do was help. So are we listening, listening to God? He speaks to us. We need to be quiet. We need to be still. Simply put, we need to shut up and listen. Too much noise, too much talking, not enough listening. God's spirit, his Holy Spirit is like an in-ear monitor to us. And if we'll listen to his voice, he will tell us what to do. But then we've got to be obedient to do that. Isaiah 30, 21 says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Listen to that voice. Talk to him, listen to him, receive from him. You see, God, God is the answer to everything that we have need of. This morning, if, 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 if you're lost, he'll be a guide. If you need strength, if you're weak, he'll give you strength. He gives rest to the weary. He gives courage to those who are afraid. He gives help to those who are in need. He gives comfort to the hurting. God is our comfort. If you're struggling in life, chances are you haven't reached out and received what God has for you. He has love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. 
all things that he has for you if you'll just receive those things. And the last thing is just to simply enjoy his presence. Enjoy his presence. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Proverbs 8.30, I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence. Are you in the presence of God? Are you with him? We need an ongoing awareness of his presence that's always, always with us. I want to invite the musicians to come. I think about this idea of God's presence. We don't really deserve his presence, but I'm thankful that God gives himself to us. It's one thing to hear and read about God's presence. It's something totally different to experience his personal presence with us. See, we hear testimonies here all the time of people who, who come in you know, visiting the church uh, saying that they just feel something here. We've heard some people say, I just, I, you know, maybe they don't have a church background. They, they don't have a relationship with the Lord, but words like, all I do when I come here, I just cry and I can't stop crying. Why is that? I believe it's the presence of God. Encountering the presence of God. Do you experience his presence? Are you experiencing God's presence? Do you actively pursue his presence. I want to challenge you to pursue the presence of God. You know that he's with you. You know that he will be there. You know that he's not going to leave you. He'll never leave you. He'll never let you go. Even to the very end, he's going to be with you. We need to be with God. We live each day in the reality of his abiding, his continual presence in our lives. And his presence changes, should change the way we live. It changes the way we interact with people. It changes the focus of our, of our everyday living. And it ensures us that we're growing in our relationship with him. We need the presence of God. God's with us. This morning in the early service, there's a, a couple people, and I, you know, as I scan the audience, I know that there's some of you here that are going through some really hard, difficult challenges in life. And I don't know everything. But I look back and I see Kathy, and Kathy lost her husband a few months ago. And it's not the same without Rod, is it? But Kathy, God is with you and he has been with you and I know that that's true and it will always be true. God brought you and Rod here and, and your lives are forever changed for good. And God will be there through those difficult days and I know there's other people who've lost loved ones. Pastor Brian and Nikki lost their mom just a few weeks ago and it will never be the same but God's presence makes the difference. If you're going through, we have people going through treatment for, for cancer. God will never leave us. He's always with us. No matter what our struggle, no matter what our trial is, we need to realize and encounter and engage the presence of God. And it's not just here in this room. I can tell you that song, Surely the Presence, made a difference in group settings like this, but I can count a few times where I was alone in my car and encountered the presence of God so much so that I had to pull off to the side of the road because I couldn't see through the tears that were pouring down my face. And I knew that God's presence was filling the place where I was at just in my car. God is faithful to meet us where we're at. And this morning, I want to encourage us before we go just to encounter the presence of God. What are you facing? What are you dealing with? Maybe everything's going smooth. It's like blue skies and a gentle breeze and you're just kind of sailing through life and everything's good. You know what? We need God's presence, not just in the hard times. We need his presence always. So this morning, I want to invite you to stand and we're going to end with a, just a time of worship. And I want, to, I want to challenge you this morning to encounter God, his presence. 
He's here in this place. We know that. Right? It's the truth. God is here. But I want to challenge you to be with God. So as we worship, I want to, I want to ask you just to reach out. You know, there's times where I, I have been in a place like this, and I can take you to a time I was, in, I was somewhere in my college years, and I remember this very specifically. I was in a Sunday night church service, and I had a lot in my mind to do, and I really wasn't listening. I really wasn't paying attention because I was focused with what was going on here. And at the time of the service, I just thought, it's time for me to leave. And I turned around and I walked down and I got to the back of the sanctuary. And it was like God spoke to me and just this overwhelming sense of do not leave. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. God's going interrupt, to interrupt me again. And I just had this overwhelming sense that whatever I had planned was nothing for what God had planned for me. And so I turned around, and before I could get up to the front of the sanctuary, there was just, I was overcome with the sense of the presence of God and His power in my life. And it's those moments, those encounters with God that sometimes happen because uh, we're, we're intentionally going there, and sometimes it just happens out of the blue. But I need, we all need to encounter God's presence. Not just know that He's there, but to really engage Him and be with Him.